introduction here. Okay, so William Temple made this statement. I'm really curious to see what you think of this statement. Okay, be honest with me, okay? Nine o'clock was a little hesitant to answer. They gave the right answer, but I think there might have been some people holding back. We'll see here. So it's a safe place. We can agree to disagree. Here's the statement. The church is the only organization that exists for its non-members. True or false? Somebody said yes. I love that. So that's the right answer. So if you had a different answer, you'd probably be embarrassed if you say it now. I'm just joking, but that's okay. But seriously, it's a great slogan, but I've got to tell you, I have a lot of pastor friends who ran that past their membership, and it cost them their jobs. So what do you think? Does that bother you to think that the main purpose of the church is to help those outside the church? Um, I've got a, my mentor, David Hyatt, who's also a church consultant. He told me the story about this leadership team of a church he was working with, and they were trying to become more outward-focused. And so he showed, you know, he, he came, and he does these sessions with them, and he came, he, he, he preached on the, the parable in Luke 15 about the two sons. You know, we call it the parable of the prodigal son, but there's really two sons in there. I'm not sure which son is worse off, but I'll let you figure that out for yourself. But you know the story. The younger son, you know, brazenly disrespects his father, and he blows a major chunk of the family's net worth, and then he staggers home one day with the faint hope that he can at least sleep outside with the golden retriever. And so he is stunned, along with everyone else at the boundless grace of his father who receives him with open arms and announces, let the party begin. Now there's one person at the party who is not having a good time, and that is the older son who is furious because his sense of justice has been violated. How can the sorry excuse for a kid brother so disgrace himself and the rest of the family and then not even have to pay for his selfishness? And so Dr. Hyde is preaching this to this church group, this leadership group, about how to become more outward focused. And so that's, he, he's on the verge now of pointing out that Jesus clearly intended you know, religious people like us to see themselves in the character of the older son and then to join God in taking the initiative to reach you know, sinners. But before he could get to that point, one of the lay leaders blurted out, but what about us? And his face was red and the veins in his neck were protruding. Why are we supposed to care about the sheep who's out there somewhere when there are already 99 sheep right here, right now, who need to be cared for? And it wasn't really a question, it was more like a projectile. Now, to give the guy a benefit of the doubt, later they found out he had lost his job earlier in the week. So he really found it impossible to think about reaching a hurting world when there was so much hurt on his own plate. The problem is most churches have followed suit with similar thinking. You know, we want to reach people for Christ, but first we need to stabilize our budget. Uh, one of the first churches I attended actually said, I heard a lady said, say this, a woman say this. She said, well, before we, can work on, before we can work on quantity, we need to work on quality. And I was thinking, does that mean she doesn't think we're very quality people? What does that mean? I don't really know what that means. Um, I've been to churches where they say, well, what's the, what's the point of going after unchurched teenagers when there are you know, missing in action kids in our own congregation? Activating those kids should be our first priority. And so apart from an unrelenting commitment to an outward focus, churches will find a hundred reasons not to establish a strategy to make disciples. So will we or won't we be a blessing to those beyond our own circle? And God's, good, and God's news is good news indeed when it's on its way through us to the next generation of lifelong members, learners, disciples. So the presence of Timothy, someone who is receiving from us the gifts and insights that we've received from God, is the surest evidence that we actually believe the famous last words of Jesus as he ministered on earth. Christ's great commission is marching orders for every generation. They're found in various forms at the end of each gospel and in the book of Acts, but the most widely cited version is in Matthew 28. It's in your insert. It declares the reason for our existence, that our call is to be disciples who make disciples. That ordinary people like you and I, we are empowered by an extraordinary God to go to every nation 
This is the direct fulfillment and the logical extension of the promises that God gave Abraham way back in Genesis chapter 12. You may not remember that part of that story, but in the Old Testament, Abraham is told that his descendants will become this great nation and they're, they're going to inherit a specific piece of geography and that he himself will be blessed. And so God's people may expect to receive God's blessing, which may be defined as that assurance that God has already acted and will continue to act to meet our deepest needs. And so being blessed means that God has taken personal responsibility for our well-being. And so Abraham, like us, Abraham didn't always feel blessed by God, right? I mean, on many days, he didn't feel it. Sometimes we don't feel it. You might even feel like the world is collapsing. But God promised to bless this one man and his family, and God kept that promise. But that's not the whole story. As a result of God's graciousness to Abraham, the, the senior citizen will be a blessing. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through him. And so God blesses people for a reason. We don't merely receive good things from God. We become conduits of those good things so they might be in transit through us to other people, even people to the ends of the earth. See, Abraham was not a spiritual cul-de-sac, just accumulating God's best stuff and holding on to it for his own purposes. The Bible's formula, first stated in Genesis and echoed throughout both Testaments, is this. Letter A, we are blessed. We're blessed. Anyone disagree with that statement? Well, you don't have to raise your hand. I mean, but don't you agree? Aren't we blessed? Especially the people in this room. But letter B, we are blessed to be a blessing. To be a blessing. Churches typically get the, and Christians typically get the first part of the Bible formula right, but we fail to cultivate a large enough vision for the second part. And so as I mentioned in the first two sermons of this series, if you weren't here, it's crucial to know that Christ is Lord. And it's liberating to discover that we are His deeply loved servants and disciples. And it is transforming to be mentored by a Barnabas figure in our life. But... If living, it, but if the, if the marks, if, if those things mark the limits of our experience, then we are living out a mutated version of the Christian faith. And it's become all about us. It's become very self-centered. We may be certain that we are seriously out of step with the Father who extends His arms to the lost Son. Tony Campolo kind of presents a picture of that same thing with a story he tells about a factory and this factory is humming along busily with this immense force of workers everybody's doing their job and this visitor tours the factory greatly impressed with the work of this group and at the end of the tour though the visitor says well wait a minute you never showed me the shipping department what shipping department asked the guide well you know the place where you send out everything the factory produces well, we don't have a shipping department. The amazing thing about this factory is that it's entirely self-sustaining. Everything we produce is used to keep the factory running. So how do we grow churches with a vision? No, uh, how do we grow churches with a vision larger than just self-maintenance? See, Christ's body doesn't exist in order to stay in shape. Christ's body exists to grow. And so to be faithful to the Bible, our experience of A, being blessed by God, should lead us to the fullest possible expression of B, offering our lives as a blessing to others. And it seems to me that very few American Christians have made that jump from an inward spiritual focus to an outward discipling focus. We're all blessed, but for what purpose? My own experience is that Christians fear the consequences of focusing on statement B. They worry that in trying to bless others, they'll somehow lose their own blessing. But God's good news is that an outward focus doesn't diminish our growth, it accelerates it. And obeying God never shrinks our life with God, it always multiplies it. 
See, Jesus assumed that it would be the normal business of every one of his followers to pass the baton of spiritual life to others. He was fully, uh, he, he's fully resourced this project for us. I mean, he says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me, and surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. So we want for nothing. We really do. Grammarians point out that the central verb in the Great Commission is make disciples, and it's modified by three participles, going, baptizing, and teaching. And so as we go through the, the paces of daily life that, that we bring, equip, and send out new disciples into the kingdom. And sitting in worship, it's really easy to forget that our planning and praying should essentially be about our next hundred members, not the hundred members who are already in the fold. So you've got a page of, do you, do you all recognize what this is? It's like if, you're, if, you're, if you don't recognize what this is, you are legally young. Okay? Because this is part of a phone book. It's in your bulletins or if it didn't fall out. Now, don't worry, we're not setting up a call center right now. You don't have to call, you don't ever have to use this piece of paper again. Though it could be a good, helpful reminder to you of a couple things. That there are real people, these are people in Woodford County. I mean, I don't, I got the Sopers on my page, that's pretty cool. And what fun, what's funny is, is, I think this is from 2005, and I don't think you were coming to this church in 2005. This is an old phone book. We couldn't find anybody with phone books anymore to help us with our pages. So we had to, to cut the one phone book we had in like little teeny pieces. So that's why they're so small. I really wanted to give you a whole page. But the whole point of this is that if you look at these names, you might even know some of them. And God cares about every single one of these people. These are human beings for whom our church exists. In every case, those who aren't yet worshiping and ministering alongside us, they aren't just names. These are unique men and women and families for whom Christ died. So how shall we reach them? We're going to need a plan. Zach Hample is a man with a plan, uh, a plan to catch baseballs. Rick Riley, a Sports Illustrated writer, interviewed him for Sports Illustrated um, when he was still a 23-year-old student from New York City, he wrote the book, How to Snag Major League Baseballs. Like, really creative title there. Um, because over the previous 11 seasons, he had personally brought home 1,680 Major League balls. And at the time of publication, he had a streak of 264 straight games in which he had caught at least one baseball. What's most amazing is that he averages six balls a game which is like six times the span of just a few, in, few, in a few hours, what most of us would like consider, a, you know, like a once-in-a-lifetime event. How does Zach do it? Well, as he explains in his book, use your head. You have to be in the right place at the right time. And so Zach knows when every major league ballpark opens for batting practice. So he's always first in line to catch a batting practice home run ball. Zach has even memorized where certain hitters are likely to foul off pitches. And I'm thinking, I read this, and I'm thinking, if only the average congregation devoted half as much time and energy and research to making disciples as Zach devotes to snagging baseballs. So we're going to need a plan. Now, this is not the same thing as searching for a, a program, okay? I mean, a program is like what every church is looking for. It's like a magic bullet, they think will eliminate all of our needs uh, to pray and to discern God's will and to trust the work of the Spirit. I mean, you can't do an end run around our fundamental need to place ourselves humbly and helplessly at God's disposal. In reference to disciple, to disciple making in the local church, Dallas Willard writes, no special talents, personal skills, educational programs, money, or possessions are required to bring this to pass. We don't want to be picky over the details of how this is done. It just needs to be done. So how is God calling you to reach the next generation for Jesus Christ? How are you going to, to get it done where you already live and work and worship? Now, I believe that, that one person helping another person become more like Jesus is attainable, normal, and desirable for every one in the church. One size and one, one style does not fit all. 
when it comes to helping disciples go forward with Jesus. We need a collaboration. You know, last week we talked about lecture classroom, apprenticeship, and immersion as ways of learning. We're going to need to use all three of those methods. But the greatest opportunity to disciple in the average church is the one-to-one, you know, Barnabas to Saul or Paul to Paul to Timothy kind of relationship. It's where two people agree to target deeper growth as a Christ follower over a longer time. There's one sentence from Paul more than any other that might help us understand what it means to pass the baton of faith. It's 2 Timothy 2.2. He writes, And what you have heard from me through many witnesses, entrust to faithful people who will be able to teach others as well. And so let's just look at that verse for a minute. What does a discipling relationship look like? Our first observation is simple. Discipling is relational. It's relational. People learn how to to better love and follow Jesus in the context of a focused friendship. I mean, the you in 2 Timothy 2.2 refers to a a spiritual apprentice named Timothy, and the, the me refers to Paul. And so Paul has recruited Timothy at least 15 years earlier on his second pass through Timothy's hometown of Lystra. And since Timothy is still described as young, At this stage in his life, he must have been a very young person indeed at the beginning of their friendship. On the pages of the New Testament, we have the privilege of watching Timothy, this raw and sometimes painfully shy recruit, gradually grow up into his role as Paul's apparent successor. He is sincere and devoted, but is sometimes intimidated by theological opponents. He suffers at least one setback in Corinth, where he's trying to corral these belligerent believers, and it's really like trying to corral or herding cats in the end for him. And so Paul tenderly describes him as my true child in the faith and my son, and even says to the Philippians, I have no one else like him who takes a genuine interest in your welfare. Paul makes another statement that confirms he wasn't the first person to really influence and disciple Timothy. He says elsewhere, I have been reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother, Lois, and in your mother, Eunice, and I am persuaded now lives in you. So there were already three generations of faith under Timothy's roof. And so I hope you will discover that the spiritual apprentice of God's choosing for you may already be sitting at the dinner table with you every evening. The second observation is that discipling is personal personal. Timothy didn't learn how to follow Jesus by taking a course at a local community college and then memorizing his notes. In 2 Timothy 2.2, Paul refers to what you have heard from me. And so the basics of the disciple's life are mediated through the unique personality and style of the discipler. So even even the few details that we have in hand about the earliest Christian leaders reveal a wide range of temperament and ability and approach. For instance, um, Stephen, I don't know how many of you are familiar with Stephen in the book of Acts, he liked to confront people. Probably not an approach I would take, maybe you wouldn't take. And in fact, it really didn't work out that well for Stephen, if you know the story. I mean, really, if you're going to listen to Stephen preach or talk to you, it's like you need protective gear, okay? Because he would say things like, you stiff-necked people with uncircumcised hearts and ears. And I've heard, you know, pastors express the thought, you know, I'd love to get a few things off my chest during my last sermon here. Well, that was Stephen's last sermon ever, okay? They martyred him for that one. So I'm not saying that's a good approach, but it just shows you there were unique approaches in the New Testament. But take Philip, for example. Philip offered a more Socratic approach. He asked, you know, the eunuch, do you understand what you are reading? Have a conversation. Epaphras let his fervent prayer and his servanthood and his hard work do the talking. See, the good news is that we don't need to, to imitate or reproduce one approach to discipleship. I mean, during college, I was taught how to share my faith with strangers. I never felt comfortable doing that, but I had to. And so I would have to go to people and say, do you have a few minutes where we could talk about spiritual things? And I've got a couple stories from that, but I, I, I just all it did was give me an upset stomach. 
And God may have worked through some of those conversations, but the long-term legacy of, of bombing runs like that, aside from, you know, not feeling well afterwards, is it, is it gives a negative association of, of sharing our faith, of evangelism. That, that whenever I thought of evangelism, I automatically felt uncomfortable. I felt guilty that I didn't do enough of it until I come to, came to understand that God has especially wired me to share my faith through a style of, of Q&A and give and take that naturally happens during long-term relationships. I mean, how many of you started coming to church or you're a Christian because a family member or a close friend brought you or invited you. That's it? No, seriously, this is not like a rhetorical. How many of you are, are Christians today because a, a family member or a friend like, helped you along? Okay, that makes more sense. You guys scared me for a second there. Not that everyone's like that, but most of us are. That's why it's important to share your, your faith or invite people to church who you already know. Why? Because it works. I mean, you're evidence of it. They'll listen to someone they know cares for them. Because before you can really share, they have to know how much you care. I mean, I know most of you would be uncomfortable and probably uh, less than fruitful in sharing your faith with strangers as well, just like me. That's why I love uh, Bob's uh, Great Neighborhood Cookout initiative. He's going to talk about that in a few minutes. But there's an insert there that you can check out when, when he gets up to speak, not beforehand. But this is about relationship building, this initiative, which may or may not ever lead to an opportunity to share your faith or invite someone to church. It's just a way to demonstrate the kindness of God in very practical ways. And that's what, that's what we're doing when a few of us go to the laundromat each month or so to help people, you know, pay for their laundry. That's why we give stuff away, you know, most years at the Twilight Festival, because the world is used to hearing how the church is always asking for money, so we're uh, proving to them that we don't. I mean, the only time we ask for money are within these walls if you're already a participant and active in this fellowship, because there's some real needs for that. But we want to show people in our community how much we care for them personally. We love them because God loves them. And then number three, discipling is theologically grounded. Paul tells Timothy he needs to entrust these teachings to other people. The Greek word there for entrust means like making a secure run to the bank to deposit a treasure. And so here we, we need to be careful to remember that discipling another person is not just like dumping information onto them. I mean, Paul knew Timothy. He loved him. Disciples, you know, people outside the church or whatever, you know, no, we're not widgets, okay? We're real people. And so every human being is uniquely made in the image of God. And so the ways we teach and model and pray and share life with that person will always include elements of sheer mystery because of that. The number four, discipling is intentional. It's intentional. It doesn't happen by accident that all of us are involved in hundreds of unrelated, uh, unintentional relationships every week, but most of them are brief. Few of them bear significant potential for transformation. And so a discipling relationship, on the other hand, assumes a purposeful direction and is nourished by regularity. And so if there's a Timothy or a prospective Timothy in your life, Listening is more important than talking, and learning how to listen to a particular human takes some time. One of the reasons that relationships are spiritual adventures is that we can never know precisely how the Spirit will work in the context of another human life. And then fifth, discipling is reproducible. Reproducible. Paul commands Timothy to entrust what he's learned to faithful people. Where is he going to find those people? Because all of our culture's extraordinary speed of communication and the relative social isolation of many vocations, I think disciple-making increasingly, in my observations, are done within webs of existing relationships. You don't have to go meet everybody. But there are certain relationships that bear fruit, coworkers, neighbors, friends, family. The harvest of seeds planted years earlier in discipling relationships, is one, it's one of the greatest joys of being in ministry. 
You know, ask Sunday school teachers or youth workers, youth leaders who've done it for any amount of time. They're often struck with awe as, you know, their kids grow up and get married and, you know, they have children of their own and, and they navigate all of these passages with faith-molded hearts. That God is always at work in spiritually focused friendships, even when we don't have the eyes to see that. So have you made a commitment to help bring about Jesus' last and greatest wish for this world? If you don't have a plan, are you willing to learn one? And if you don't have the motivation, are you willing to seek the motivation? And if you don't have a Timothy, will you begin praying right now about who that might be? Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this opportunity to remember not just who you are, but to really give thanks for those who've gone before us, who without their influence, whether they be family or friends or other people that we've met along the way, we wouldn't be here ourselves. We wouldn't have the blessings of knowing you, Lord. We wouldn't have the love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control that we do have. So we're thankful to you, Lord. But not just thankful that it will be ended right there, that we somehow will just move on from that, Lord, but we want to be motivated. We want to know how that we can spread that and share that with others. Would you teach us? In Jesus' name, amen.